All right, homies, what is up? It's the Tominator. So just a heads up, but this video is meant to be a follow up to the one from a few weeks ago where I endeavored to explain why professional bodybuilders don't use full range of motion when they're training. Now, this channel has been known to occasionally put forth some controversial viewpoints in the past, but I figured this partial rep topic was innocent enough. I guess what I didn't count on was it taking off and reaching far beyond the hardcore bodybuilding community, which is who I make my videos for, by the way. Because holy shit, once the form police and team natty camps caught wind of this, we were in store for a shit show. Safe to say, I've never had a comment section on one of my videos become so damn toxic. It really devolved into a full-on flame war down there with everybody trading insults back and forth and a bunch of clueless credins huddled in the corner shouting, STEROIDS! over and over. Well, more than a bunch actually, more like a friggin' avalanche of this crap. It's just so wonderful how literally hundreds of incredibly astute commenters felt the pressing urge to point out that professional bodybuilders, wait for it, use steroids? No way, gee golly fam, thanks for that astounding revelation. The rest of us would have never figured it out. Like stop, just stop guys, you're embarrassing yourselves. It quickly reached a point where I no longer bothered to screenshot and just deleted these verbal excrements on site. Anyway, we'll get more into the drug debate later. But as for now, if you science nerds thought that last video was bad, you ain't seen nothing yet, because here today, we'll be defending bro science itself. Lord knows, with Rich Piana out of the picture, it seems like nobody else in the fitness community is going to do it. And I tell you, I had to work up some courage to put this one out, because it's probably my most savage video to date, and I know that supporting bro science in any way, shape, or form is going to paint a giant target on my back and draw the relentless form police like Moss to a flame. But... Fuck it, somebody needs to stand up for bodybuilding. And yes, it is 2019, thanks for the cogent reminder. But the more burning question, in my eyes at least, is when will fucking form Nazis die out? When will these know-it-all, pseudo-intellectual kinesiologist wannabes with less than five years training experience under their belt stop pretending to be omniscient weightlifting experts? But before any of you in the above-mentioned categories go smashing that dislike button, at least hear me out. Because maybe, just maybe, bro science is more than just the misleading collection of meathead myths and false claims you think it is. Maybe there's actually some wisdom to be found here too. But before we dive down this rabbit hole, I think it's important to define what we mean by quote-unquote bro science in the first place. Well, for starters, it's not a real word. The regular dictionary ain't gonna help us here. Thankfully, there's good old Urban Dictionary, this white boy's go-to resource when trying to puzzle out the cryptic street slang of the latest rap song. And this first definition isn't bad, it captures the essence alright, though I'm not really a fan of the derisive tone, as if personal experience from people who actually get results carries no weight. This is the entry I prefer. I'ma scroll through it nice and slow so you can read it all, but hell yes. This sums it up perfectly. I especially enjoy the little dialogue at the end with Professor Schnutgarten, it's just a brilliant piece of satire from the other side of the argument. Well done, muscle stud lacking any irony, couldn't have said it better myself. See, sarcasm and hyperbole cuts both ways, kids. If you want to paint all steroid users in the same negative light as these primitive meatheads who can't add 2 plus 2 together, we can likewise depict all you lab coat natties as a bunch of scrawny dorks with no gains to speak of. While amusing to a degree, neither one of these petty representations really captures the truth of the situation. The other thing I love about this description, though, is that it alludes to the fact that science is constantly evolving. It's never static, it's always changing. New studies will invariably come along to overturn previous findings, and what was once considered cold hard fact later becomes invalidated. It's something to bear in mind for all you analytical types who think science holds all the answers. If you really believe these studies are infallible and unlikely to be contradicted at a later time, you simply don't understand how the scientific method works. Shit, I can find studies to contradict your arguments right now. That's why I'd rather put my stock in real-world evidence accumulated by those who have actually been there and done it. Not some hyper-situational study conducted by a bunch of chemists and sponsored by a supplement company involving all these contrived parameters and a homogenous sample group comprised entirely of complete beginners. Of course, full range of motion and basic compound movements are going to be more effective for beginners. That's because they're starting from scratch with next to no muscle mass and wouldn't be able to achieve decent contractions on isolation exercises if their lives depended on it. Look, I'm not ashamed to admit it took me literally years before I could properly feel machine preacher curls, but now it's one of my favorite biceps exercises. The catch-22 with attaining a solid mind-muscle connection is that you need a certain base amount of muscle to connect with in the first place. And the more muscle you have, the easier it is to target specific areas of the body at will. Hence why the idea of constant tension or isolating different areas of the same muscle 
are such foreign concepts to many newbies. Speaking of newbies, it should be mentioned here and now that textbook form is mainly just a guideline to prevent beginners from getting injured and snapping their shit up. It's pretty much like what Captain Barbosa said about the pirate code. Because once you reach an intermediate or advanced level, you learn that a little body English or cheating isn't going to kill you, and you stop lifting like some kind of rigid robot. Look around and you might notice that, for the most part, the only people who actually adhere to 100% strict textbook form are girls using feather light weights or personal trainers slash YouTube fitness instructors doing demonstrations for their clients or viewers. Of course, like anything else, there are exceptions to the rule. Dorian Yates and Lee Priest were both noted for near picture-perfect form, but that's like two big-name bodybuilders in a sea of hundreds. And when it comes back to the topic of full versus partial reps specifically, do you really think the human body gives a damn? Please, people, muscles are dumb. They don't care about some arbitrarily defined range of motion. If they're contracting and forced to move heavy weight, they're going to respond and they will grow, assuming you provide them with adequate sleep and nutrition. It's as simple as that. And this is why I find the form police so utterly ridiculous. All these comments saying that three-quarter reps won't work for us naturals, you really believe those last couple inches are going to make all the difference? Come on, guys, use common sense. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not denouncing science here. You'd have to be an outright idiot to dismiss the scientific method as a powerful tool for understanding the world, given that virtually all of our technological advancements over the past several centuries have been derived from it. But on the flip side, you'd have to be an arrogant twat to immediately discredit the personal experience of proven professional bodybuilders who've been busy busting their ass, laboring in the trenches, and passing on their extensive first-hand knowledge. That's not to say that we should only put our faith in anecdotal reports and dismiss the science altogether. Obviously, certain outdated ideas like the anabolic window, spot reduction, or building a peak to the biceps, for example, have been largely exposed as myths since the time they were first propagated. So science can certainly be a useful means of tempering anecdotal claims and advancing the prevailing wisdom. But still, even if you can't technically spot reduce fat by targeting specific areas or develop a biceps peak if you're not already so genetically inclined, it's easy to see how such fallacies first came about. By training the midsection directly, you can definitely develop more defined abs that will help make an otherwise flat or slightly flabby stomach appear more ripped. And if you happen to be genetically predisposed to having peaky-shaped biceps, I have no doubt that certain highly focused exercises like concentration curls can help bring that quality out. So even in myths, we can often find a kernel of truth. Look at how Arnold himself, one of the original bros, if you will, summed up his feelings towards the so-called experts who told him that lying leg raises were not an effective movement for abs. And going back to that earlier definition, I think it's plain to see that, at its roots, bodybuilding is bro science. Bro science is really nothing more than a derogatory term invented by some pretentious internet nerds trying to belittle the time-tested methods used by pro bodybuilders throughout the decades. Mind-muscle connection, time under tension, the pump, pyramiding, high volume, hitting the muscle from different angles, isolating, peak contraction... These are all fundamental staples of bodybuilding and have been since at least the days of Schwarzenegger. So if you scoff and roll your eyes at these notions or believe that machines have no place in an effective workout, I would hazard to say you're not a bodybuilder. And that's perfectly fine. Many weightlifters aren't. That's why we have powerlifting and strongman and crossfit and all these various approaches. We all have different goals at the end of the day, so not everybody ought to train the same way. But it's worth noting that this is a bodybuilding channel through and through, so if you don't care for that, what exactly are you doing here? If you want to do your full body workouts or push-pull days and intermittent fasting or whatever other hipster method is currently in vogue, by all means, go ahead. I'ma stick with a good old-fashioned bro split myself because it's worked fine for me up till this point and for many others as well, and even during plateaus I can still enjoy the variety it offers and the overall process itself. Say what you will about bodybuilding, but this style of training never gets boring because there's always a new exercise or training technique to try out, and every workout can be fun and unique. (sighs) I'm just sick and tired of all these condescending keyboard warriors constantly bashing bodybuilding ideology because it doesn't conform to the latest studies they happen to hear about. And notice how I say hear about, not read, because it's painfully obvious most of you don't actually read said studies at all given that none of these detractors in the comments section link so much as a single source. Like really guys, if you want to go running your mouth playing the part of the haughty academic, at least do your homework and cite your sources. 
But then again, I can hardly blame you. After all, who in their right mind wants to spend their free time digging through some boring-ass scientific journals just to learn about something as basic as pumping iron? I find it rather amusing that everyday average Joes who just want to get fit feel this neurotic need to appeal to scientific studies when it comes to working out, when that's not the case for virtually every other sport. I mean, if you want to get good at soccer or basketball or tennis, football, what have you, do you go look up studies to learn how to play? Hell no. You go practice and have fun and listen to what people uh, around you and your coaches tell you. So why should lifting weights be any different? How about this? Here's an idea for you, Poindexter. Why don't you go outside, get your ass to a gym, and try stuff out for yourself? You know, trial and error, be your own test subject and all that. Theory is all well and good, but I'll take personal experience over theory any day. Ugh, but I digress. The bottom line is that the classic bodybuilding style, this so-called bro science, can work for anyone, including naturals, not just roid monkeys juiced to the gills. Many natties tend to adopt this defensive us-versus-them mentality when it comes to the drug-free versus the chemically enhanced, and I never really understood this, even as a lifelong natural myself. There seems to be a lot of jealousy and pent-up resentment directed towards pro bodybuilders, and the way some of you guys talk with more obnoxious self-righteousness than a preachy New Age vegan, you'd think that roid users were an entirely different species or something. Like, look, no one is denying the impact of anabolic steroids and their ability to build muscle with relative ease and on a scale that would otherwise be physically impossible. And it's true that gear users can get away with things that simply wouldn't work for the rest of us, like little fluff workouts with high reps and light weights. But at the same time, how deluded or just brain dead stupid do you have to be to pin it all on the drugs? Do you seriously believe all it takes to become a Mr. Olympia contender is to stick a needle in your ass and go through the motions? Like, come on, some of you kids are so hopelessly naive, it's laughable. These bodybuilders I feature are far and away the best of the best, the cream of the crop. Newsflash, there's literally millions upon millions of people taking steroids across the globe right now, and only a select handful, maybe 20 to 30 tops, will ever manage to step foot on an Olympia stage. So these so-called steroid losers you're so casually dismissing represent the top 0.0001%. They are what the NBA is to basketball, the best in the world at their chosen profession. So to claim they don't know what they're doing and only made it because of the drugs is akin to arguing that NBA All-Stars only got to that level because they're six foot six and can jump really high. It's like, yeah, that's a big part of it, but it's far from the whole picture and also incredibly ignorant. Rejecting a pro bodybuilder's advice wholesale just because they're not natural is like refusing to take dribbling advice from Kyrie Irving because his hands are bigger than yours. Or complaining that Steph Curry's shooting form is incorrect, according to some textbook you read. But then again, that's the form police attitude in a nutshell. They're like a bunch of dogmatic religious fanatics convinced they know better than everyone else. And if you think it's just a matter of magnitude that the only thing separating the pros from the amateurs is the amount of drugs they take, then why isn't Boston Lloyd competing in the Mr. Olympia already? Where was Rich Piana all those years? Those guys' drug stacks read like some perverse cookbook recipe, for God's sake. So, case in point right there. I really shouldn't need to say any more. Do you begin to see the foolishness, the sheer audacity of discrediting the first-hand insights of the pros who do this for a fucking living while you sit at your desk watching YouTube all day in between jerking off to hentai porn? Okay, that was a little unfair. Maybe you prefer midget porn. I don't know. Point is, they dedicate their lives to this shit. We don't. So get off your high horse already. Now, that's not to suggest that you have to agree with them all the time or take whatever they say at face value. It's always healthy to remain skeptical, question things, and arrive at your own conclusions. But don't assume you know everything there is to know about resistance training already just because you watched a couple of X videos, made some progress in the gym last year, and think you have it all figured out. There's this phenomenon in psychology known as the Dunning-Kruger effect, where beginners, or people who are otherwise at a low skill level, ironically tend to overestimate their own competency and abilities the most. The 18th century poet Alexander Pope summed it up beautifully. A little learning is a dangerous thing. See, when we first start working out, we typically stumble across one or two credible sources of information, whether that's a popular fitness YouTuber or an elite bodybuilder or just your current workout partner who's been lifting longer than you. This person becomes our role model, our main mentor, guiding us along our path to physical enlightenment, and we believe everything they say unquestioningly. 
and that can be a dangerous spot to find yourself in. It's essentially a form of self-inflicted tunnel vision where you subconsciously block out any conflicting information because as a beginner, it's all too easy to become overwhelmed. So you crave certainty, right? Human beings by nature try to avoid this uncomfortable state of cognitive dissonance as much as we can, which can often mean adopting a closed-minded attitude towards anything that threatens our internal sense of identity or purpose. How else are we to explain some of these unreasonably emotional reactions to something as inconsequential as proper form and partial reps? I mean, the way some of you guys were acting, you'd think I was attacking your fucking religion. I can recall back around 2003-04 when I first started to really get into lifting, and this was back in high school, I went out and bought a copy of Arnold Schwarzenegger's Encyclopedia of Modern Bodybuilding. Remember, there was no YouTube fitness scene at the time, no Scooby or Athlean X or Six Pack Shortcuts, so who better to learn from than one of the most jacked movie stars ever, who also happened to be a world-class bodybuilder back in the day. What's funny is that when you're a beginner and come across a credible source like this, you take their advice as gospel. If Arnold said to avoid a certain exercise because it would make your waist appear thicker, you best believe you're going to avoid that shit like the plague. And sometimes this advice is entirely sound, but other times it's just more a matter of personal preference being passed off as fact. What you'll find looking back in the years to come is that you unwittingly adopted a lot of this individual's biases and questionable idiosyncrasies. One example that stuck with me to this day is that on Skull Crushers, aka Lying Tricep Extensions, Arnold was adamant that lowering the bar to the forehead and extending straight overhead was fundamentally incorrect because the triceps were no longer fighting gravity at the top. Instead, he advised to lower the bar behind the top of the head and stretch back with the elbows more so that at the top of the movement, your arms would be at an angle rather than perpendicular to the floor. And it makes sense, I totally get where he's coming from and can see the logic there. But the fact remains that most people, amateurs and professionals alike, do not perform the exercise this way but continue to lower it to their forehead and extend straight up. I used to inwardly sneer at anyone who did this and think smugly to myself about how this ignorant noob didn't know what they were doing, even if they were significantly bigger and better developed than I was. Until shortly after I discovered Flex Magazine workout footage of Kevin Lavroni and Sean Ray doing exactly what Arnold stated not to do. And there's no question that both of these 90s legends had better tricep development than that of the Austrian Oak. No offense to Arnold, but he was always more about the biceps than the triceps, and even admitted he could never mentally connect with his triceps the same way he could for buys. So anyway, the young me was now confronted with a bit of a dilemma. On the one hand, Arnold, my unofficial iron mentor, said this technique was wrong. But on the other hand, here's these two amazing looking bodybuilders going against his advice and evidently getting even better results. Eventually I realized that both methods are acceptable and each has its pros and cons. Doing it Arnold's way keeps more tension on the muscle, but you can't go quite as heavy, whereas the other way allows you to lift more weight and still get a solid stretch and contraction. Ultimately, it doesn't really matter much, it's still the same basic exercise. The moral of this long-winded story is that just because a supposed expert tells you this is right and that is wrong, doesn't make it true. In most cases, there's more than one way to lift effectively, so try to keep an open mind. Don't become overly reliant on what one person says, even if that person represents your own personal fitness Jesus or something, because there's not merely one true path on this iron journey, there's many, many different roads you can take, and at the end of the day, it's ultimately going to depend on you to determine what's most effective. And you do this through trial and error, not by sifting through study after study trying to find the one perfect fail-safe approach. So don't knock something until you try it, don't make the beginner mistake I did of blindly following a mentor. Instead, take bits and pieces of advice from everybody and see what works for you. That's the path of continual learning and long-term growth for anything in life, not just pumping iron. I'd be willing to bet that a lot of the critics and naysayers on that other video, not all, but certainly many, are relatively new to the gym. Perhaps they've only been lifting for a year or two and have fallen into that same closed-minded trap of the Dunning-Kruger effect. It's easy to succumb to this superiority complex where you think you know better than everyone simply because you found a role model who appears supremely knowledgeable in your eyes, so any opinions that clash with his must by definition be wrong, and all the people who hold them must simply be ignorant or misguided. But again, resistance training is not a one-size-fits-all. There are so many different valid approaches and ways of working out that can be effective. And finally, an interesting trend I noticed uh, when reading through the comments is that a lot of the older guys out there tended to agree with the idea of partial reps as a useful method for preserving the joints and preventing injury. Could it be that full range of motion is better suited for younger, more limber lifters, while partial reps are the way to go for the more seasoned iron warriors among us? 
you got to remember, most of these modern Olympia competitors are in their mid to late 30s, if not their early 40s. So maybe that at least partly explains why they like to shorten the range on many exercises. This would also coincide with how old school bodybuilders like Schwarzenegger and Hiskin tended to maintain a longer range of motion, because back then they typically retired by their late 20s or early 30s. Anyway, this video is getting pretty long, and I'm tired of explaining. I doubt I succeeded in convincing any of the naysayers anyway, because that's like trying to convert a lifelong atheist, or convince a diehard religious believer that there is no God. So I realize I'm fighting an uphill battle here, but had to vent and just get some of this shit off my chest nonetheless. Hopefully, even if you didn't find any of this rant educational, it was at least more entertaining than reviewing another dry scientific study off PubMed. If you made it to the end, thank you for watching. And don't forget to leave a like and subscribe for more if you enjoyed. Until next time, this has been the Tominator signing off, and I'll be back.